Hello and welcome to Agriculture Live. My name's Rebecca Shields. I'm one of the directors at Agricultural Recruitment Specialists. Now, don't go anywhere. You don't want to miss this. It's a great episode. It's all about Red Tractor and food assurance in the UK. Um, if you've got any comments or questions, please post them in the chat and we'll come to them when we can. So straight over to the guys, Steve and Sam, would you like to introduce yourself, where you work and so on? Yes, yeah, so, so, uh, so I'm Stephen Shields, I'm the Technical and Sustainability Director of Hunter Black Produce. So we're a fresh uh, fresh produce uh, supplying company, a family owned business, fourth generation, um, supplying the main retailers. And as part of my role as the Technical Director, I also sit on a number of boards, one of them being the Red Tractor Board, along with Sam, and uh, I also sit on the NFU board as the vice chair for the horticultural board. Thanks, Stephen. Um, hiya, I'm Sam Trevi. I'm the Fresh Produce Technical Manager at Red Tractor. So I have um, responsibility for all kind of fruit and veg in the, in, um, in the sector. Um, and I've been with Red Tractor about, um, about one and a half years and previously have worked at a um, a food manufacturer, um, you know, doing um, doing farm and supplier audits to, to various kind of retailer standards. Okay, so how did you guys get into the food industry and why? Well, I, I started in the food industry. Uh, I was I was calculating this before about thirty six years ago now. Uh, so I started in in the um, in the meat sector, working in the protein for a number of years, and then I moved across to fresh produce about 18 years ago. Uh, I moved over, when I moved over to Hunter Pack, and I've been there ever since really. So uh, yeah, I think food's always been what I've done, so I've always like worked in it really. And so. you, Sam? Um, so yeah, so not quite as long as Stephen, but I've, I've kind of first started working in the, um, in the food industry probably about 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago. Um, so I'm, I live in South Lincolnshire, so it's obviously a big kind of agricultural, horticultural area. Um, so yeah, it just started off as a, um, a weekend job in a local kind of food manufacturer. Um, and yeah, I, I sort of worked my way up in the, through, the, um, through that company, doing a few kind of various operational roles. Um, and then eventually getting into into technical and fresh produce, which you know I, I really enjoyed. I've been doing that for the past kind of 10, 15 years of my career. Brilliant. And is the food industry a good industry to be in, and why? Do you want to go? Do you want to... <laughs> I think I think for me, I find it. Um, I think every day is different in the food industry, so you, you have like different challenges every day. You know whether that's. Um, ethical challenges, audit challenges, environmental or customer challenges. So every day is different. And that's and that's one thing that, that I've liked about the food industry. And that's why that's why I've stayed in it for so long, really, I think. It's that it's that variability that every day is totally different. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, Steve. And I, I think also it's um I think what's perhaps not maybe so well appreciated is that within the food and farming industry there are so many different roles available. You know, there's um you know, I personally work in, in, in technical, so ensuring that food's kind of, you know, safe, really, at, at the heart of it. But also, that you know, that there are, you know, you could be into into um, uh, marketing, commercial, um, you know, digital and data roles are becoming more important in the industry. Um, you know, and it's a safe industry to, to work in because everybody's going to need food. So, um, you know, you're never going to, uh, you're never going to lose that, that need there. Well, you definitely weren't affected by COVID, were you? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was still eating. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I know, Steve, obviously you sit on the board at Red Tractor and Sam, you actually work for them. How did you get into that? Um, so in, in my previous role, um, I was more, um, so I, I was carrying out supplier audits so to, to various different different standards um, across the UK and, and across the world to, to you know to, to some extent as well um, so I, I, I did that role for about 10 years I think so I've got a, you know a good background in um, you know in food safety standards and then yeah I moved into Red Tractor about a year and a half ago so um, you know stepping back from doing the audits myself and, and more um, working on de developing those standards Okay, so there might be people watching that 
don't even know what red tractor is. Could you tell them for those that don't know? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, so in, in simple terms, you know, Red Tractor are, um, you know, the, the company, the body that own um, and develop the standards for, you know, each of the farm sectors we operate in. So, you know, that's uh, combinable crops and sugar beet, fresh produce, uh, beef, lamb, dairy, pigs and, uh, and poultry. Um, and we also operate some kind of post farm gate standards as well, you know, more in the, um, in the livestock sectors. Um, so Red Tractor uh, farmer members are audited against those standards by an independent third party certification body. And then following a successful audit, um, growers or farmers will receive a, a certificate to market their project Red Tractor assured. So this means that the Red Tractor logo can then be placed on the end product, um, you know, on the supermarket shelf. And then that reassures shoppers that the food and drink that they're buying has been produced to our high standards and it, you know which ensure that that you know that food or drink is safe it's traceable and it's well um, so the, the team at red tractor so we, we're a fairly small team of about 30 35 people um and so where i fit in in the in the um technical department we have a technical manager for each of those farm sectors and we help to develop those standards by working with our you know our sector board which is uh, made up by various stakeholders from across the supply chain, uh, including Stephen. And that includes, uh, um, you know, includes growers, processors, um, you know, experts from across the industry and retailers. And it, that ensures that, um, you know, growers' interests are represented when we develop the standards and every part of the supply chain, you know, has a level of input where necessary. And how many standards are there, Sam? Um, <laughs> um, what are the main standards? I've, I've, I've not, I've not um, counted them, but uh, you know, in so we have um, a few different, se several different sections within the within the standards, um, and it covers some core kind of principles, such as, like I said, about traceability within within fresh produce. It's really, um, you know, that food safety element is so important because because a lot of what we produce in fresh produce can you know can be eaten raw so so we have to take that into account um you know so so we have standards in place around things like um irrigation water use compost and manure applications and um you know worker hygiene and things like that to ensure that there's you know that we we really control and, and reduce the um you know the risk of contamination of the product throughout the throughout production okay and how did this scheme come about um so i think the red tractor scheme f first um was first developed about over two two decades ago um it was originally known as british farm standards and was really set up um by the uk kind of food and farming industry to reassure shoppers um of the safety of british product produce that that was kind of on the back of a, a series of food safety scares in the 1990s that was you know involving E. coli, salmonella, and, um, and BSE was, was really the big one. And the, you know these issues like this are thankfully they're, they're now nowadays they're, they're quite rare. And trust in British food has, has you know has come a long way since then. I mean I'm I'm kind of just about old enough to remember the the, BR, the BSE crisis. And you know back then people would would avoid British beef, and that kind of seems unthinkable today. I think I'm, you know I'm sure that Red Tractors had a part to play in you know in re rebuilding that trust. So who were the main users of Red Tractor then? So we have about altogether about 50,000 uh, British farms who are, you know, who are farmer members of Red Tractor. Yeah. We have about 600 uh, food businesses across the UK which make a Red Tractor claim on their products. So that can be either, um, you know, using the logo on the, on the pack or, or kind of using it as part of their, um, you know, buying specifications. Um, and altogether, it covers around £16 billion worth of food and drink per, you know, wow. per year is, is Red Tractor assured. Um, so, it, so it's a requirement of, you know, most of the big UK retailers. And who funds it or is there a charge? How does it work? So, so it's funded in part by farmer members um, and also in part by, the, by those kind of licensed food businesses that, that are using the logo. So it's, it's kind of 50-50. Um, and so we, we operate as a on a not-for-profit 
basis. So all of our income is then reinvested back into our operations and, and marketing. So marketing is a big part of what we do as well. You might see the um, the television adverts. Um, so yeah, so, so there's that kind of consumer awareness um, marketing aspect as well. Is this where the Buy British thing came from? I, th I think there's, um, you know, I think that there's various um, initiatives in in place. You know, I, th I think NFU have similar initiatives, and you know, AHDB do a similar thing on the um, yeah. the meat and livestock sectors. Okay, doke. So, how you're a farmer, you know, um, you've got product produce. How do you become Red Tractor Assured? What do you need to do? Um, so it's it's a fairly simple process really so so the scheme's kind of open to any uk farmer anybody can apply to become a red tractor member um so once they've applied and had a you know a successful audit and they've resolved any issues that have been found they'll then um they'll then receive a certificate from their certification body and will then be become red tractor assured so they'll be able to to make this claim on their on their products and then yeah, after this initial assessment they'll then have um annual re-audits to take place to kind of maintain that certification um and yeah any any issues that are found within that cycle that there's a, a process for um resolving them and do you think enough of the general public and food consumers know about red tractor um so our um our research shows about i think about 74 percent of shoppers uh you know recognize the logo and it's you know that's significantly higher than any other kind of comparable uk um, farm assurance scheme um like i said a big part of what we do is marketing to to try and get those key messages across to to shoppers to you know to really reinforce what the scheme stands for okay and so what are the benefits of being red tractor assured i think i think the benefits from a, a from a food business organization is it is it does uh, offer an element of due diligence for a business, you know, and it offers, it provides customers with um, a bit of um, uh, a bit of back, a bit of um, what's the word I'm after, a bit of confidence in what they're purchasing is what it, it provides them. And I suppose if you want to export the products as well, it gives that that people, it gives the exporters that 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 that, that uh, confidence as well. So it does provide that. And are there any drawbacks? I think. I think one thing that's been talked about a lot recently has been about audit burden uh, and about having too many audits. And as, as a sector from a horticultural sector, you know, there are, you know, we, we, as, a, as a business our size, we might get up to 20 audits a year across retail uh, accreditation bodies and red tractor. And I think, you know, the, being on the red tractor board, one thing we are looking to do is to look at how we um, align the assurance scheme of red tractor and how we try to make that a more efficient process as well so that, that is going on in the background as well okay and when do you think that will be that will be done well i think it's early stages so far isn't it sam but i think you know it's 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 i think the present is it's gathering what the sort of feels are about red tractor and, and what changes could be made well there's a whole process to go of governance all the rest before we get to any further stages on that so Stephen, talk to us. Why are food standards so important in the UK? I think um, I think we've got like world class standards in the UK, really, for food production. And I think that does offer a level of confidence, as I said before, for buyers. I think I think it offers a level of due diligence as well. You know, um, if there are issues, you've got that due diligence to, to fall back on. But I think overall, it's, it's the confidence piece about having that having that confidence for consumers to buy into it, whether that's meat, whether that's poultry, whether it's fresh produce. It does it does, it does give that level of confidence, really. And does the red tractor logo mean free range? Um, so, so I mean, so all of our core red tractor standards should be you know should be accessible to all UK farms. Yeah. So our standards in the poultry sectors are, you know, they're world leading in terms of, you know, things like hygiene and animal welfare. Um, so although we don't require all of our poultry members to be operating at free range standards, um, we do offer a free range, you know, like an add on assessment, um, you know, to those farms who are free range to allow them to kind of demonstrate those credentials to customers. And, that, and then they, they're able to use, you know, a separate 
Red Tractor Free Range logo. Um, we, we, also, we also offer, a, in, in the poultry sector, we also offer a, an, an enhanced welfare um, add-on, which is, you know, similarly to the Free Range one. It, it allows them to use a separate logo, and that's for farms that are, you know, providing even more space for birds, in re- enriched living conditions, um, and using, like, slower-growing breeds, which are in line with requirements of the, um, the better chicken commitment. Okay, and so what can you tell us about the UK food industry and where it's at currently? I think from the UK, uh, well, look at the, the veg sector that I work in. Uh, there's uh, some DEFRA stats that come out recently that show the veg sector is actually going backwards from a, from a, a, home, a home procurement or home uh, grown sort of status. It's going backwards over the, since about 2018, the numbers are going backwards. So from a level of food security, we're probably about 52% or that sort of level. And the rest have to come from imports. I think I think what the industry has seen over the years has been consolidation within the sector as well, um, you know, which is which is a shame for some of the smaller growers. And I think really as a, as a sector, what we need to get better at doing is, 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 is really getting that breadth of growers out there, really, rather than trying to consolidate. I think it needs to have more growers in it. We need to bring new entrants into the sector as well. How do you think we could bring more people into the growing sector? I think it's a challenge, you know. It, you know, if 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 went on Dragon's Den with the idea of putting some crops in the ground and growing them yourself, uh, not knowing the outcome you're going to get, not knowing the weather they're going to be under and all the rest, they probably wouldn't invest into it. It's a very difficult uh, uh, business to get into. Really, is is, is horticulture. I think mm-hmm. I think for new entrants coming into it, I think I think we talked to earlier. I think there are a range of jobs people can get into. And I think as we as we progress and as we become more autonomous within this, you know, using autonomous vehicles and the skills become uh, a higher skill set, I think we'll see more people wanting to come into the sector, I think. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. I um, agree with Steve and it's, um, you know, I, I think one of the, maybe one of the issues, you know, I think the average age of a UK farmer is... Um, close to 60 so you know we, we have um, an aging cohort but not enough kind of new um, young people coming into the industry and I, I, I don't know I wonder if there's a um, perhaps a lack of appreciation as to how how varied those roles can be you know you can work in agriculture without being you know you don't necessarily have to be a, a boots on the ground you know a, a, you know a tractor driver or, or or that kind of or anything more physical than that there, there's roles within agriculture in you know in the background in things like um digital and data and, and kind of exciting new um, new technologies like that which might be more attractive to younger people perhaps but um yeah i, I think also um i think labor is a you know a, a big issue and you know labor availability is you know i think perhaps going to become more of an issue as we as we go forward um you know stephen mentioned um automation which you know could be a could be part of the solution but i think we're you know we're not there yet and we're always going to need need stuff absolutely and it's we don't want our uh, figures for food security to go down we want them to be going up don't we really absolutely yeah okay and so in terms of those considering a career in food are there generally many opportunities available yeah, I think, I think there are. I think um, you know, if, if you look at our business, it's we have we have a farming operation, a packing operation, and a distribution side. <coughs> so across, you know, and that's just one business. And you know, so within that, there's a range of jobs and job functions that need to be fulfilled. You know, um, so I think I think there is that. I think I think within the within the horticultural sector, there's a lot of a lot of business reinvest in people as well and really try to bring people on and, and, and develop them within the sector uh, so i do think you know normally if you, if you enter the the horticultural sector into fresh produce you do get you do seem to stay in it for a period of time and it's the same faces within the sector moving around so i think it is one of those that when you do end up in it you do stay in it for a very long time absolutely so why should people consider food as a career path you know, there's going to be students watching, deciding, you know, which way they're going to go. What can you say to them? 
I think there's a wealth of different. Sorry, it's dumb. I think there's a wealth no. of different, uh, different opportunities for for people to join into, whether that's uh, MPD, whether it's uh, spraying, whether it's uh, agronomy uh, or uh, account management or, or technical or quality. You know, th there's a whole host of jobs available for people. I think you know, working in fresh produce. There's all sorts of overseas travel as well, available as well. If you know, if you start getting involved with companies that import and export, so so really, it does open up to to every sort of job you could think of in fresh produce. Absolutely, yeah, think? yeah. I, I was, uh, yeah, I agree with everything Stephen said. I mean, from a personal point of view, I like I said, I started my first role in in the food industry when I was when I was sixteen. You know, still at school working at. Um, um, you know, a, a weekend job putting putting pots of coleslaw in boxes was my, my first role. Um, so you know, not not especially glamorous, but th but th within that business, I was um, you know I, I kind of worked my way through into you know doing various different roles along the way. Um, and you know, I had all the relevant kind of on the job training and qualifications, etc. And you know, when when I got into um, when I got into a technical role, I, you know, like Stephen said, I had the opportunity to travel the world and, you know, see places I wouldn't have otherwise been able to see, um, you know, and, and I developed the relevant skills to be, you know, here where I am today working at, at Red Tractor. And from what I can see from a recruitment point of view is that there's lots of opportunities for career progression once you get your foot in the door, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you both, over to you, Sam, firstly, what do you think are going to be the next big issues in the industry going forward? Because I ask everyone this. I think um, I wasn't sure whether to say this or not, because I'm sure everybody says the same thing. But, you know, I think climate change is, is you know, obviously going to have such a huge and I think is to some extent already having such a huge impact on the sector. I think, you know, that the past, um, you know, the winter just gone, I think was one of the one of the one of the wettest we've seen for for a very long time. And that. That had a big impact on on crops and i think we're probably still seeing some of the knock-on effects of that so i think as we see more and more um you know extreme kind of weather events whether it's you know flooding droughts extreme temperatures that's going to have um i think not only an issue on actual crop production but from um you know from my point of view that from a food safety point of view you know there's potential in, impacts there so you know you might have where you have flooding you have the the um the opportunity for, to spread, you know, pathogens and, and um, you know, sewage water, things like that across fields. So that, that presents a risk. And also as, I guess, as ambient um, environmental temperatures, soil temperatures increase, you you know, that, that might create a more favourable environment for certain uh, bacterial pathogens as well. So there's all these other things that might have an impact as well as, um, you know, the, the climate potentially um, it could be more favourable to certain pests and diseases of, of crops as well. So that I think there's lots of different ways it could affect food production. Um, I think that you know, it's, I think it's not not entirely all bad news because I know that there's a flourishing wine industry in the UK, which is you know has been made possible by climate change to some extent. So I guess the role of the industry is to you know to adapt and change to those you know to those um, those challenges. And what do you think, Stephen, are going to be the big issues? I think I think uh, Sam's right on the climate change front. I think weather over the last couple of years has been, well, it's been uh, extremes really, from extreme drought a few years ago to extreme wet, as we saw last year. So obviously that has impacts on crops and the growing of crops and the, and, and the yields that you get from those crops as well. So I think weather has been a key, a key change over like said, the last three to four years in our business particularly. And then I think linked to that, there's been a lot of talk about risk and resilience within the supply chain. You know, and a lot of people are putting more emphasis into looking at how we can uh, mitigate risks of extremes of weather, whether that's imports or whatever it might be, or look at different growing areas or different varieties. I think linked to that has also been costs. You know, costs within the sector have been going up over since COVID, really. And then because you have the Ukraine war, which was forced fertilizer prices up. So I think costs are one thing that, that, that are a, a significant issue for the sector. I think, you know, if you look to if you look at the profitability of most large produce businesses, there's probably not a lot of profit being made from from them, really. Um, so I think there's, an, there's a piece of 
for people to understand like the, the cost of producing food, which are, sometimes I don't think food consumers really understand the cost of what it is to produce, you know, fresh produce. You know, if you look at all the different inputs and all the different costs associated to it, there's a whole host of costs. And yet, you know, you see carrots on a 50p a kilo, whatever it might be, and it's, it doesn't really cover that sort of cost, really. So I think costs are a key part. And I think we need to start looking at how we can make consumers understand what goes into producing our products in our, in, in, in our sector. Absolutely. What In terms of what could we do to help farmers get the margins up, do you think? I think a lot of it is consumer understanding, really. You know, I mean, if, if you looked on as if you looked at what what the inputs are, so you've got seed, you've got seeds, you've got land rent, you've got um, tractors, you've got to plow, you've got to bed form, you've got you know, you've got all your farming costs. Then you've got all your processing kit and your processing costs, of which these lines are all bespoke to to deal with fresh produce coming through them. Then you've got a labour cost, which is ever increasing, and, and you know, under this. Your labor government i think that's going to go up again which isn't a bad thing but it's going to go up again and then from a transport point obviously diesel is going up all the time so all these costs all build into the end product cost really and, and and i think it's it's how we get consumers to understand that really and understand the value of fresh food because i don't think consumers understand that food here is cheap isn't it indeed yeah i think if you looked on the continent compared to the uk prices you know, yeah fresh is relatively cheap really yeah but it's how you go about it isn't it mm. absolutely well i really really enjoyed that discussion both sam and Stephen. and um, you've given us some great insights into the food industry the importance of food assurance and all about red tractor so it's so good to have both of your inputs today thank you everyone for watching and listening um keep following us we have some great new discussions coming up including speaking with Dan Smith, who's a Nuffield scholar, and we'll be talking about how to get the next generation involved in agriculture and farming. But if you've got an interesting topic in agriculture that you would like to talk about, please get in contact with me via Agricultural Recruitment Specialist, which is www.agri-rs.com. And if you'd like to hear more on new issues and topics within the agricultural and farming industry, you can follow us on various channels, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts. Just look up Agriculture Live. So that's all from me. Thank you for joining us. And Sam and Stephen, would you like to say goodbye? Yep. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.